So I think we should probably kick off, sir, and then uh, I'll update people by text as they come in. Okay, sounds good. So those of you that don't know me, I'm Randy Labonte, and I'm going to be the guy that's active on the keyboard. If you have a question, just text there. If Michael needs to kind of have a make a comment on it, I'll prompt him as well. Uh, but uh, sit back, enjoy the ride. All right. Well, okay. welcome, Thanks everyone. So. Um, we've got a, a small group in comparison to the registration, so I'm hoping that folks will uh, file in as we're getting going here. And um, if you, uh, for those of you I don't know, and I see a couple of names here that I don't think I've had a chance uh, to meet or interact with in the past. So I'm Michael Barber. I'm at uh, Toro University of California, where I'm an associate professor of instructional design. Uh, although I'm originally from Newfoundland, so, um, uh, and I spent, I guess, most of my, well, actually, I guess right about now, I'm at the tipping point where I'm just past most of my life being off of the island instead of most of my life being on the island. So I guess that's a little bit unfortunate now. I can't say that I'm no longer, that I've spent most of my life in Newfoundland. I've spent a little bit less than half of my life in Newfoundland now. Anyway. Um, so what we're here to talk about today, obviously, is the State of the Nation report. Um, so the, if you haven't had a chance to review it, it is up on the website in both English and in French. Um, and uh, the PDFs are there available as well. There's a full resource uh, that's there that includes a, a lot of other uh, items as a part of that. And in many cases, as we go along here. When we talk about specific resources, Randy will often post the URL in the chat there so that folks can just pop over to them. Um, so this is the 2019 edition, which essentially covers the 2018-19 school year. So in terms of the data and information that's in there, it would have essentially ended around um, the end of the summer semester for the 2018-19 school year, which would be around uh, August of 2019. So, you know, what we're talking about here is obviously about six months old in terms of the datedness of the, the data that we have here. And that's just been the pattern with all of these. So if you're new to the State of the Nation project, uh, we've been doing them for quite a while now. The uh, 2019 edition is actually the 12th one that we've uh, completed up to this date. And, um, it's a, a project that uh, was originally sponsored by what was called at the time the North American Council for Online Learning. It eventually became the uh, International Association for K-12 Online Learning. And then you can see at about the five year, six year mark, we patriated or repatriated uh, the report uh, back to Canada and uh, between the Open School BC as well as the uh, Manitoba First Nations Educational Resource Center, along with a partnership that we've developed with Candy Learn, we've been producing the report uh, here in Canada ever since. So I'll be honest and say that the report wouldn't exist without the sponsors that we have. And um, it, I, I want to highlight these folks because, in all honesty, if it wasn't for them, the report probably would have died out when INACL stopped sponsoring this particular activity. Uh, those folks uh, on the screen there have really stepped up and, and provided a lot of support for us, um, not just in terms of financial support, but a lot of in-kind support. So as I mentioned, Open School BC does the publishing every year and all the copy editing for us um, between Learn and uh, the uh, Centre Francophone de l'Education à Distance or CFED. Um, we have a completely bilingual website and the last three reports that have been produced uh, have been produced both in English and French because they've translated them in kind for us. Um, some of the others that you see there, Virtual High School has been a, a sponsor of the report now for almost a decade. So, And it's really these groups that have kept this going because it is a, a big enterprise that Randy and I have to do every single year in order to get this completed. So Randy's already posted it up in the uh, chat window there, but the full website is available at k12soten.ca or k12stateofthenation.ca. And uh, I'd encourage you to go there and take a look at it. In particular, um, if your main interest is looking at a particular jurisdiction, 
the data and information link is really going to be useful to you because that will actually take you to a listing of all of the provinces and territories and essentially you can sort of zero in on to what's happening in your particular jurisdiction uh, those profiles tend to be a full profile that's written there whereas in the actual pdf of the report we just provide an update as to what's changed uh, and we also include all of the previous years profiles there so you can actually go from year to year and see how things have changed over time another thing that we've got there is we have a table that includes the most recent response that individual programs have made to our survey that we collect data on from them so that should um, give you a sense as to where your individual program is in relation to others and if you look there and see that the information that we have from you is a bit dated you could either if you are part of the leadership of your program go in and update that information yourself or if you aren't part of the leadership of your program, you could go and contact your leadership and recommend that they uh, update that information. In terms of where we get our data on an annual basis, um, much of it will come from the various ministries of education that we um, survey every single year. Uh, you'll see throughout the, the matrix here, um, they tend to be our most reliable source of data year in and year out. Um, you'll notice that we also do rely particularly upon some jurisdictions uh, on key stakeholders. These are folks essentially that are on the ground that um, are able to give us a good sense as to, you know, here are the specific regulations from the ministry's perspective, but here's how that actually works in practice, you know, how it operates on the ground kind of thing. Um, many of the jurisdictions that we're looking at here, um, and you'll see it increases over time, are producing written material either in the form of reports or things that are going up on the web that we're able to use as a cross-reference for some of the information that we're being told from the various ministries across the country. And then of course we also have our individual program survey where we ask each of the, um, I guess it's just under 300 pro uh, online and blended programs that we've been able to identify over the years. Um, essentially we just ask them uh, everything from their level of activity to the types of technologies they're using in terms of synchronous versus asynchronous, uh, a little bit about the nature of how their program is set up, the number of teachers they're employing in terms of both full-time and part-time folks, um, if they're a full-time or supplemental program, the number of courses that the number of unique courses I should say that they're offering, um, and typically it's around that, um, I've seen it as low as I think 11 or 13 percent and I've seen it as high as 36 percent uh, on an annual basis. So being sort of right in the middle there in the low 20s tends to be where we find ourselves year after year. You'll see that some jurisdictions, particularly those that only have one or two programs, uh, tend to respond at a very high rate. Um, you know, because we only need to get one or two responses. Uh, those that have a lot of programs, uh, they tend to fall down in terms of the numbers. Uh, one that I will mention in particular is Manitoba. Um, you know, each of the 38 school divisions in Manitoba have the ability to offer distance education through one of the province's three uh, forms of distance education that they offer, but only one of those school divisions had responded to us in the past year um, and you'll see in a couple of slides from now that tends to be a consistent uh, response rate from them in terms of having a very low or poor response rate uh, from the province of Manitoba. So if you are from Manitoba here in this room or if you know if you have colleagues that are involved in e-learning in Manitoba um, this is something I'd, I'd you'd really appreciate it if you could reach out to them and, and recommend that. Uh, similarly, you'll see BC and Ontario are also kind of low. Uh, so for those folks in the room that are representing programs from those two jurisdictions, again, we'd love it if you were able to uh, reach out to your own program leadership and complete uh, those surveys for the coming school year. 
So um, even when you look at our, our historic rate, and I said it was a couple of slides, it's actually the next one. Um, we started doing this particular survey about eight years ago. So we didn't do it throughout the whole history of the report. Um, but in the last eight or nine years, you can see that there are some jurisdictions where we really haven't heard from folks at all. Um, so to use Manitoba as a good example, um, you know, roughly three out of every four programs that exist in Manitoba, we have never received a single response from them in the history of this project. Um, over half of the programs that exist in Alberta, we have never seen a, or, uh, heard, had a response from them in the history of this project. The same thing with Ontario, 60% of the um, programs that exist in Ontario, we've never received a response from. And for that matter, nationally, it's still only 50%. So of those 270 programs that have existed at one point in time, um, as we've done this survey over the last eight years, half of them, actually, if you look at it, it's a little bit better than half because it's one, uh, you know, you've got 134 there, which means that 136 is the number we haven't heard from. Um, just over half of them we've never received a response from ever. Um, so getting into the data that we have here. Um, so the first is uh, just taking a look at structurally how programs are set up. And as you can see from the map here, uh, there's a variety across the country and it really is a bit of a mishmash. Um, there are a couple of trends, but only a couple. And really the, the main trend uh, that you can see is in Eastern Canada and you see them now developing in the territories, there tends to be a single province-wide program or in the case of New Brunswick, two single province-wide programs, one for the Francophones and one for the Anglophones. Uh, but most of the other jurisdictions you see either have primarily district-based programs or have some combination of provincial programs and district-based programs. And even this kind of model is a little bit misleading in some instances. And I'll point to the province of Ontario as one of those where um, this model is a bit misleading because while Ontario says that it's primarily district-based programs, the many of the aspects for those programs are highly centralized in nature. So in the case of Ontario, the Ministry of Education through uh, the Technology Enabled Learning Unit uh, provides a learning management system for all of the programs to use. They provide centralized content and resources, a student information system. It's really only the management of the actual e-learning program that happens at the district level. So while the programs themselves are primarily district or in their case, school board based because they have school boards as opposed to school districts, um, there's still a, a fair amount of centralization in that system. Uh, and I mention that because you see the other two blue ones there, Alberta and British Columbia, for the most part, they don't have, actually not for the most part, not at all do they have that sort of centralized model. They are completely decentralized in the way in which they operate. Uh, so they really are truly primarily district-based programs. Um, looking at the regulation that we have across the country in terms of how these programs um, operate, and for that matter, um, the rules under which they operate. It's interesting and uh, again just this chart in and of itself without having read the report is a little bit misleading because you can see that according to the table legislation is the primary way in which these programs are regulated um, but the legislation that uh, you find in most of these jurisdictions basically says that the Ministry of Education, or in many cases, the Minister of Education, shall have the authority over distance education. And that's sort of where it ends. So um, in, in many jurisdictions, that is literally all of the, um, all of the, the legislation that's there, it's a single sentence. Um, so if you exclude the jurisdictions that have just that as part of their um, 
their language, it, it would actually change the way in which this looks to the point where for the most part, um, you would have British Columbia and Nova Scotia being the primary ones that are governed by legislation. In the case of Nova Scotia, it's through the collective agreement that the government uh, has signed with the Nova Scotia Teachers Union. Uh, there's a dozen or so provisions in there related to distance education or distance learning that are included in that particular um, document and uh, being a collective agreement, it's obviously passed by the, the House to come into effect. Um, in the case of British Columbia, there are uh, a single section of the Schools Act and then a single section of the Independent Schools Act are related to um, what they refer to as distributed learning. And um, that's where much of the governance for uh, these programs and much of the regulation for these programs comes into play. Uh, one of the few, I guess, other exceptions to this is the jurisdiction of Quebec. Um, in the past couple of years, Quebec passed an amendment to their, uh, their, their Education Act that allowed for distance programs to be uh, put into place on a pilot basis. And as of the end of the 2018-2019 school year, even though the legislation had been in full effect for a complete school year, there hadn't been any that had been put into place. Although, uh, as it stands this school year, I believe there's at one, maybe two, that have started under that particular pilot project. Um, so other than those exceptions, you'll note that it's some combination of either policy handbooks or memorandums of understanding that really govern how distance education is, is regulated. And the MOUs are primarily for the North where all three of the territories have memorandums of understanding with programs that exist um, in the Southern provinces. So in the case of the Yukon, they uh, have a memorandum of understanding with uh, the Northern British Columbia Distance Education School, as well as uh, CFED, uh, to provide their francophone options and I believe the Vista Virtual School as well uh, in on Alberta, although I'm not sure if that MOU is still active. Uh, Northwest Territories and Nunavut have agreements with the Alberta Distance Learning Center um, to provide their distance education. So looking at the amount of distance learning that's going on, which always seems to be a, a, a question Randy and I get quite frequently, uh, right now, we're looking at about 6% of all students in, the, in Canada that um, are engaged in one or more online courses. Although, as you can see from the province by province accounting there, there's a lot of tildes uh, listed there, which uh, basically means that there's a lot of approximations that are there. In some cases, those approximations are there because they are largely estimates. Um, so in the case of Quebec and, and Ontario, I would suggest that it's due to largely an estimate. In the case of um, the uh, in the case of uh, British Columbia, um, as well as Manitoba, it's mainly due to the fact that uh, essentially trying to account for the students that might take, particularly in BC, longer than a full school year to complete their studies. So while the students may have only been funded for one school year, they're taking parts of a second school year to complete. So because of that, it um, messes a little bit with the actual number of how many students are engaged in, in distributed learning in that province at any specific given time. So um, as you can look through, you'll see that there are a couple of jurisdictions in particular, um, Alberta and uh, British Columbia that are well ahead of the national average. You can see that Manitoba, even though very few of their programs ever respond to our individual survey, are right about the national average. And then all of the other jurisdictions are below the national average, with essentially the north and eastern Canada being well below the national average, whereas the, the middle parts of the country and, uh, tend to be much closer to the national average for some reason. Um, getting a sense as to how that has changed over time, you can see that 
really for most of the last uh, six, eight years, you know, the number has actually remained fairly consistent. I mean, if you look, say, from 2012, 13 to the present, the number has ranged basically in about, let's see, 15, 11, uh, about 25,000 is, is the range that it's been. And it's always been somewhere in that with the high, obviously, you can see there being at 6% in the 2014-15 school year. But um, for the most part, you know, it's always been in that 5% range and most of that time in the high or the mid to high end of the 5% range. So um, there's been a great deal of consistency during that period. And, and it's interesting because, you know, if you look to where we came from, the, the Canadian Teachers Federation, roughly, well, not roughly, exactly two decades ago now, estimated that there was about 25,000 students engaged in one or more distance ed courses across the country. And now we're looking at, what's that, 12 times the number um, right now. And, and in terms of percentages, it's, it's 10 times the percentage, actually 12 times the percentage too, I guess. Um, so when we look at it in terms of that kind of respect, um, we've seen the, the growth has um, been, I would say, quite phenomenal. Um, particularly when we compare ourselves to other jurisdictions. Um, at the same time in 99-2000 in the U.S., uh, Tom Clark estimated that there was only about 50, he said between 40 and 50,000 students that were in the U.S. that were learning one or more uh, courses online or at a distance. And considering that they've got 10 times the student body, uh, as we do, 10 times the number of K-12 students as we do, and the fact that they only had approximately twice as many students learning at a distance, I think speaks to the fact that Canada has really been a leader in this area for much of that period of time. Um, if you look at on a province by province basis over say the last four years and see how that compares, um, in some cases you'll see that it's been fairly consistent. Um, and then in other cases, I would suggest that you've you see a refinement or a, um, an improvement in the way that data is collected or that data is reported. Um, you know, so if you look at, I'll use Alberta as a good example. The information that we were getting from the Ministry of Education in the province of Alberta up until this past year has always been the number of enrollments. So we weren't able to get a fix on the number of students exactly. And that was actually an extrapolation based upon, they told us that, you know, there was, you know, I can't remember the number for last, you know, for the 17, 18 year, but say it was like 87 or 88,000 or 89,000 enrollments. And we would look at that based upon what we knew from the individual program surveys to try to figure out, you know, how many students were taking, say, a single course compared to the proportion of students taking two courses and the proportion of students taking three courses. And we would try to extrapolate, essentially, if we have X number of course enrollments, how many Y students does that equal? Um, whereas this past year, they were able to give us a very specific figure. You know, there were 75,806 students that, um, in, were enrolled in, in an online cor a course that was tagged as a distance course. And we see similar things happening in Saskatchewan here. Um, and, you know, that has been, you know, when I look back over the last 12 years with the history of this project, that's actually been one of the things we've seen in many jurisdictions over time. Um, it might not be reflected just showing this table here because we only see the last four years, but in many cases, we've seen jurisdictions go through that particular um, evolution where um, essentially, and, and it may be because we were asking about it, it may be because they were just paying more attention to it or it was becoming a bigger part of what they they did as a, a ministry or uh, it fell specifically upon the desk of someone now where it was something that was just done on the side of someone's desk prior to this. 
um, but there was a better accounting of the number of students that were involved in distance learning as we were looking uh, over the course of this time. So moving on to blended learning, and, and blended learning is a bit of an, an oddball for us because while we feel it's important to, to try to at least be able to describe some of the things that are happening, it's one of those areas where it's really difficult to pinpoint. And while it's not up here on the slides, one of the main difficulties that we have with pinpointing exactly what's happening when it comes to blended learning is that if we were to ask the ministries or departments of education in all 13 jurisdictions, what do they consider blended learning, we would get 13 different definitions. In fact, one of the uh, questions that we have on the ministerial survey that we send out every year is what is the formal definition of blended learning based upon the legislation or regulation that you have in your province. And for the most part, the vast majority of jurisdictions don't have a formal definition for blended learning. Uh, the other difficulty we have in terms of trying to track this and put a number to it is the simple fact that we really don't know who to ask. Um, obviously, it's included in the individual program survey that gets sent out to those 270 programs that we uh, you know, send it to every single year. And the survey is available on the website as well as often on the Can You Learn website for anyone to be able to complete it. But if you have, you know, I use three examples here and it comes out of the report, but uh, Villanova Junior High School, where my nephew uh, attends back in, in, in uh, Newfoundland and Labrador, or Forest Glade Public School, which is an elementary school in Windsor, where my wife's goddaughter uh, goes to school. The, the leadership of these schools, even though I know for a fact that both of them are doing things around blended learning, it would never occur to them to complete this survey, A, because they don't even know that it exists, and B, even if they did know that it exists, I don't know if they would be able to describe the things that are happening uh, at their school in the same way that the online programs that we ask are able to do so. Um, so, um, you know, that's one of the, the, the difficulties that we have with this. Uh, the other difficulty is, again, just the response rate that we see from year to year. Um, one of the, as you can see, while the 2019 response rate um, in terms of the, the number of programs that are responding, if we began asking about blended learning in, in 2015, so for the last essentially five years, we've been asking questions about blended learning of these programs. And when you look at the response rate during that period of time, um, you know, it's not a, a great response rate and, and it's even less of a response rate than obviously what the all time response rate was for, um, for the uh, individual program survey. Um, and in some jurisdictions, you know, Manitoba, Ontario, in particular, we're not getting much in the way of, of, of um, data when it comes to blended learning. So there's a lot of difficulty in terms of trying to describe it, but with all of those caveats in mind, um, let me provide you with at least the data that we have been able to collect. Um, so you can see at the bottom there, you'll get a sense as to uh, where the data has come from. So in some cases, and those are the ones with a single asterisk there, um, they were extracted from the individual program responses or from previous data collection cycles. So essentially last year, the year before, um, the ones with two asterisks by them are estimates based upon what the um, ministries have reported are enrolled in their provincial learning management system but aren't engaged in online learning. So the assumption is, is that they're being enrolled by people who are providing face-to-face -face instruction. Um, and the th one, third one there, the one with three asterisks, in some cases, the ministries will provide us with a very specific number. Um, and in most cases, they'll tell us where that number comes from. Um, but they do provide us with a very specific number in a couple of instances. 
Um, so as you're looking through, uh, in that third category, there are two, there are New Brunswick and the Yukon. The Yukon actually has a formal blended learning program that is run directly out of the Department of Education. Uh, so the enrollments that they have there, those 418, are from that particular program. Again, if there were individual schools throughout the territory that were engaged in blended learning activities, we wouldn't know anything about them because that's not where the data is coming from. Um, so in many of these cases, we have the ability to say things like at least 8% of the students um, in the Yukon are engaged in blended learning. Or to use Nova Scotia as an example, you can see that was one where we had got information based upon the number of students that have access to the systems. So in the case of Nova Scotia, we can say that at least 81% of the students in the province have the ability to be engaged in blended learning. Whether or not they are is, is a completely different story because we don't know if the teachers are actually using those resources with them. Um, and I mentioned that in particular because if you look at Ontario here, which is also one of the ones on the high side, um, what will often happen is you have some schools, and in some cases some school boards, where they will literally enroll every single one of their students into the learning management system. As an individual teacher, I may not use that at all. Um, so any of the students that I'm working with, while they're counted in this 35%, aren't really actually engaged in blended learning. Um, so as you're looking at these numbers, it's important to you know, get a good sense and really understand what each of these asterisks mean and how that reflects upon what's actually happening here. Um, similarly, when we look at the trends over the past three years, again, the asterisks become important as we look through this um, so you can get a sense as to where the data is coming from. Um, you know, in some cases, as you look through that, even with all of the caveats, there's reason to be optimistic. You know, three years ago, or three school years ago anyway, there was less than half a million students that were engaged in, that were had accounts that were active in the learning management system in the province of Ontario that weren't also engaged in distance learning. Um, you know, so these are kids that, you know, their schools had enrolled them into the D2L or Brightspace environment, but they weren't taking an e-learning course. So we don't know exactly how many of those 468,000 or so um, were actually doing blended learning, but we know that at least 468,000 had the potential to be engaged in blended learning. You know, that number has gone up by 230,000 students in the past two years. So again, we don't know how many of them are actually doing things, but in many of those instances, they have the ability to do things. Um, and I say it like that because as an example, I know the one, last time I was teaching in the K-12 environment um, was back in Newfoundland and the Center for Distance Learning had a wonderful course for the Canadian History 1201 that doesn't exist anymore now. And at the beginning of the school year, because the textbook did not um, include essentially the first unit of the content, but the online stuff that the CDLI had created was great for that. I enrolled all of my students into that uh, course. Um, and I was able to use that essentially as my textbook for that first unit. But after the first four weeks, essentially, I stopped using it. So while the, um, the students were learning in a blended environment for the first four weeks of the school year, they weren't for the rest of the time. I noticed Randy is stuck up his hand there, so I think he wants to flag me for something. Well, I just think maybe, I don't know if Michelle can add, she did make a comment in terms of how the LMS in Ontario and Derek did um, in terms of that in response to Derek. Michelle, do you have anything maybe to add to the group? Didn't mean uh, to sorry, yeah, um, just to say that um, the ministry changed the process 
uh, probably three years ago so that uh, boards could not just activate all the sites. They wanted to have an accurate depiction of the use of the virtual learning environment or Brightspace. So they said that the teachers have to be the one to activate the site. And I would guess that if the teacher is activating the site, they're using it to some extent. The level of the use um, is not something that we have been evaluating, but definitely the teacher would be using it in some way. Cool, thank you for that. Um, let's see, where was Getting, I guess, as we're starting to, 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 to wind up here in terms of the, the actual use, I, Randy and I wanted to talk a little bit about um, some of the trends that we've seen both in the past year as well as over time. Um, so the first is that as a, as a project, we've really gained a much better and a much more refined understanding of what's happening um, from the perspective of distance and online learning or knowing that I think I've got five or six folks from Ontario here, uh, what would be referred to as e-learning in that province for most of the folks in Western Canada would be referred to as distributed learning. Um, and part of that is the ministries have just gotten better at providing information and knowing what it is that we're looking for. Um, but part of it is they also, I think, have a better sense as to what's happening in their individual jurisdictions. Um, unfortunately, I can't say the same about blended learning. Um, as Randy mentions in the chat, you know, counting blended learning is difficult at best. Um, I would actually go even further in saying defining and describing blended learning is difficult at best. Um, one of the things that we wrote the first year that we started looking at blended learning was the fact that as you look at what constitutes blended learning and the description that you see in uh, the literature anyway around blended learning, for many teachers as they look at that particular description, unless they had already been engaged in some form of distance and online learning, they look at the description and it really reads like technology integration to them. And in many jurisdictions, that's actually how it's formally, and by many international jurisdictions, that's actually how it's formally defined is as a type of technology integration. Um, so trying to figure out exactly how much is happening, where it's happening, who's doing it and how they're doing it really becomes quite difficult. Uh, for us. Um, but at least when it comes to the distance and online learning and to a lesser extent the blended learning, um, there appears to be a greater interest um, across the country about really trying to not just understand it, but really trying to come up with operational ways to allow it to occur and to promote that occurrence. And in many cases, um, while you can argue, and, and many do, about the specific types of things that different jurisdictions are proposing around uh, online and distance education, this is a conversation that really has only been happening in the last three to four years for the most part. Um, prior to about 2015 or so, there were very little in the way of um, ministries that were actually actively engaged in trying to um, get their heads around this. Uh, those that had very standard policies for it had them for a long time and in many cases because of geography had a, a lot of experience with this. But for the most part, it's often been uh, essentially placed upon a face-to-face -face or brick-and-mortar kind of environment. So how do we provide distance learning in a way that, you know, it fits within the regulations that we've got for brick-and-mortar classrooms? So things like, you know, how do we fund distance learning or e-learning? Um, how do we count attendance? Um, you know, things like student-teacher ratio for those jurisdictions that have them. Um, you know, that's always just been applied based upon, okay, well, you know, this is what we do in the face-to-face -face environment, so let's just use this in the, the online environment. And 
in many cases, you know, that hasn't really worked for a lot of jurisdictions. But um, in the past decade in particular, you know, we've seen, and I put three examples there, but there's several others I could have put. Um, I know Manitoba was doing a, a three-year review of their policy manual or their policy handbook that they use for distance learning. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, it was three years ago or two and a half years ago that the province of Quebec passed an amendment to finally uh, allow for these distance programs to operate as part of the regular system within their jurisdiction. So we've seen a lot of these instances where ministries have tried to do things. Uh, so there seems to be a greater interest in activity on this front. Um, one of the difficulties, and we've seen really this has played out quite prophetically, I think, in the province of Albert, or the province of Ontario, is that just because there's a greater awareness both within the ministry and in the K-12 system as a whole, um, that doesn't necessarily mean that people have a greater knowledge of, a greater appreciation for, or a greater understanding of what distance and online learning is. And all you have to do is really follow the um, popular media, or for that matter in particular, the social media that has happened uh, around the conversation that we've had about e-learning in Ontario to you know, fully understand that um, the vast majority of people have little sense as to what the e-learning system in that province uh, looks like. And in many cases, um, you know, a lot of the e-learning teachers I've talked to, particularly when in the first five to six months of the discussions around this, really felt like they were being um, characterized as second-class teachers because of the negative way in which the great work that they do in these online classrooms was being portrayed. Um, so that notion of, you know, a greater awareness that this type of learning is available doesn't necessarily translate into a greater understanding or greater knowledge of what actually happens in this kind of environment. Um, and that's been sort of a trend that we've seen play out multiple times now over the past 12 years since we've been working on this project. So again, the full report as well as all of the additional information is available there at that URL. And we've got about 15 minutes or so uh, to uh, entertain questions or comments from the folks that are here. Yeah, it's Randy here. I'm just gonna chime in with a few comments. I've been putting some information into the text chat as well about places to follow up, et cetera. Um, but suffice to say that certainly in the e-learning scope of things, or at least in online learning as it's gonna be called in British Columbia, um, this space is dynamic and moving uh, quite uh, interestingly. A lot of the motivation we can speculate about, uh, however, it is uh, more becoming more central to discussions and awareness of all educators about the benefits, uh, but also the challenges in working in a digital domain. Um, so that's, that's something that we're trying to capture in vignettes and stories and try to capture as well as in different research publications. Um, I'll put a link to a document that uh, was published on the Ontario situation, which tends to be a bit galvanizing for folks in other provinces. They're kind of seeing which way that Ontario is moving as they move forward in this this development. So I'll grab that link. Uh, Michael, do you want to just uh, carry on with any other questions that uh, folks may have? Sure, I'm not seeing any in the chat yet, but um, folks can, if they have questions, just post them in the chat there. Um, or for that matter, grab the mic and uh, ask away. Hi there. Can you hear me out there? Yep. <laughs> You're coming through fine. It's, it's Brian here and uh, from uh, BC, but uh, it was just our re most recent experience here in BC is with uh, the changes to our system are driven by funding and uh, money implications, and it's really been disheartening for a lot of us that are in the system to see it go that way. I was just wondering if that's kind of what's driving it across the country or, or around from in your study. You see that that it's 
you know, I really like that slide, the last slide about uh, knowledge. Has, the awareness is there, but the knowledge isn't. But uh, in, our, in our area, anyways, it's just that the money is driving the decisions, uh, the lack of money, or in our case, you know, we, when we had all these years of money wasn't really an issue, and we saw really great growth in our programming and the different things and the things we were trying here. And, uh, and we see that kind of fading away now. In the blended programming, um, we think that we, they've changed the language here now to, to change us to, to uh, online learning. And they've made a pretty strict definition of what online learning, learning is. And it kind of excludes blended learning from online learning. So, uh, so they won't be funded differently, like within, they won't be funded the same way that distributed learning was in the past. So uh, anyways, just thought, I was wondering if, if, if that's a factor across, across the country. Um, yeah, I don't know if it could be clear. No, I mean, you come from, that makes perfect sense. Um, I have a personal opinion on it, but I can say that the data that we collect as part of the State of the Nation survey um, wouldn't capture an answer to your question. Essentially, the, the purpose of the, the project every year is to essentially get a snapshot on it of the most recent school year in terms of what was happening in terms of the level of activity of online, distance online and blended learning, as well as the nature of regulation around um, distance online and blended learning. So in jurisdictions where they have a funding formula attached to it, and really right now there are only um, kind of three. I say kind of three, it's really two, but a third one does have a little bit of funding in it. Um, it would basically be BC, Alberta, and um, to a lesser extent, Ontario. Um, so in the case of BC, as you mentioned, their um, distributed learning was funded very differently than the um, than face-to-face -face instruction. That was part of the regulations that are put in place there. In the case of Alberta, what happens is um, essentially, students are eligible for different pots of money, and depending upon how the student is, experience is being delivered, they may be eligible for this pot or that pot or another pot. Um, and that's not just in terms of if it's face-to-face -face or online, but in some cases if, you know, you're in a rural area versus an urban area. Um, so each student qualifies essentially for different pots of money. Um, the only other one that really speaks to money at all is in the case of Ontario, the e-learning master agreement that the ministry has in place um, sets a specific dollar figure that school boards are supposed to transfer to each other for serving students from a different school board. Uh, so last year, I think it was like 780 some odd dollars but what ends up happening, Randy mentioned in the chat earlier, um, these consortiums that exist throughout the province and for the school boards that are members of the consortiums, one of the things that they've agreed to as part of their membership is that they're going to waive the uh, fees throughout because while you might take 10 of my students this year and I take 12 of yours, um, that's an awful lot of paperwork to get, you know, essentially 1400 bucks and next year it might be the exact reverse you know plus we're also sharing all of these other resources so at the you know in the long term it's likely going to be a wash so many of these uh well not many all of the consortium members have have come to this agreement um, the other jurisdictions have no reference in any of their regulations to funding in terms of funding distance learners differently than they fund face-to-face -face learners Right, and so, so if I can just jump in a little bit in terms of uh, what's happened in Ontario, the consortium model is really just a brokering and sharing between and among boards so that they, as Michael said, they don't go through the paperwork of, of money, but there's a very complex database system that is run in by Todd Pottle, who's on Canny Learn board for the Ontario eLearning Consortium. In the Francophone board's uh, situation is they have a master board that does all of that, the same thing as the eLearning group um, in Ontario. But they, they basically, they work out all the, the, the dollars and cents. And if somebody is a little short uh, in terms of not providing an online course, then they have a way in which they, they sort of balance that out at the end. Um, and at the, up to this point, Ontario Ministry of Education uh, has, has 
you know, begrudgingly allowed that to carry on. There may be more intention to centralize where it's directly run through the Ministry of Education as in other provinces when they have an online program, but that's yet to be seen. And I think, Brian, the, the same tension exists in BC about whether or not the ministry is going to centralize that control of how they define online learning and then grapple it back to, uh, to, to the, uh, you know, in that side of kind of in a controlled space. The motivations to do that, um, though, in terms of funding and policy practices are often more often than not, not pedagogically driven decisions that they tend to be financial treasury board driven decisions that have come having been involved in uh, the Alberta Distance Education Review, uh, there was Treasury Board in uh, the province of Alberta made a decision independent of anything that was being done in uh, the review or in the area and Alberta education, even with the context we had there, were not aware. So they changed the funding model. It, it absolutely changed practice, uh, you know, significantly. Uh, so we're very aware of how that, or at least I am, because I, I tend to be running around in the bushes uh, at that level in a lot of the provinces and see the direct impacts about those decisions. And certainly with any, uh, you know, connections with government folks in the ministries certainly have uh, shared an opinion about how those policy and funding decisions can absolutely sort of change, stifle or promote that kind of uh, activity. So it's, it, does, it does have its sort of waxing and waning that we've seen over the years in the provinces. Um, but the, the, if it's simplified to the point where there is $1 put out and it's allowed to be the districts and the boards and the collective in providing online program services, if they're allowed to work through the details, that's when you can see some good collaboration coming within the educators that are focused on students and where you will see some of that innovation coming forward. So there's really good pockets of innovation, uh, but they are where there's funding and predictability is stable. And to me, I, over the years, I've seen that to be probably the most important driver. I note there's a question in the chat box there from Derek about pedagogy as well as looking at benefits and challenges. Um, no, we haven't looked at those things, Derek, and to be honest with you, they are really beyond the scope of what this particular study is designed to do. Um, I can tell you that there is a wealth of literature about the potential benefits and challenges associated with both online learning and blended learning. I say potential because in many cases, those benefits aren't realized and those challenges um, tend to be um, amplified uh, due to a, a lack of training and resources and, in all honesty, commitment among those that are engaged in, in what it is they're doing. Um, there isn't a broad literature base right now about effective pedagogy in the online environment, particularly at the K-12 level. Um, the folks at the Michigan Virtual Research Institute um, in um, in the US have some resources that are there. Um, I can probably think off the top of my head of about a half dozen or so studies that I know that have been done on the topic. But for the most part, um, it isn't something that is well researched. So if uh, anyone in the room is working on their doctorate right now, or for that matter, I have to work on a master's thesis um, as part of their, of their own um, educational personal development. Uh, there's some topics there that uh, uh, need exploration and uh, that would benefit from a, a very empirical based approach. But uh, unfortunately, both of those things are uh, beyond the scope of this particular study. So we've got about five minutes left if uh, folks have other questions. Um, otherwise, um, you know, I don't want to keep you here if there's no uh, queries that folks have. So um, I'll just put up, um, here's my specific contact information. And I know Randy normally types his into the chat box there. Um, so, but if you do have things that you think of after the fact, feel free to reach out to Randy or myself and uh, we'd be happy to interact with you. And we'll hang out again for until the bottom of the hour in case folks have additional questions. Otherwise, uh, 
you guys uh, have a, a great evening and it was a pleasure uh, being with you here for the past hour. Yeah, thanks all.